What are the psychological factors that influence cravings for unhealthy foods and how can I manage them? All right, let's dissect this question a little bit. So the question is about uh, psychological factors. So what's sort of going on maybe at the brain perspective and the cravings for quote unquote unhealthy foods. Uh, I don't have the person sitting in front of us that asks the questions, so I can't ask any follow-up questions, but you know how I am. I always do that. And I have a few questions for this person, but I find it, I find it interesting that they've put psychological factors and unhealthy foods. There's a relationship there already. And the unhealthy foods part, I have a, I have a question. question about- yeah. What, so there's things pop up for me. I don't know about you guys there when I hear that. What, yeah. What do you define as unhealthy foods? What are you, what are you categorizing as unhealthy foods? Yeah. I mean, this comes up a lot. Like I, we, what's the, di- what's the difference between healthy and unhealthy? We, we've said it on the show a million times. So many people still don't understand or don't know what healthy feels like, what, mm-hmm. what being healthy feels like. Cause they just have never been in a very healthy state, uh, for whatever the reasons are, whether that's mentally, emotionally, physically, you know, all of those things. So And and I think it's really easy to label something unhealthy very quickly if it doesn't fit a narrative or a specific, uh, maybe it's, maybe that's the word I'm looking for is narrative. Like things get demonized. You know, when I think about certain foods, I know I've done it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I think that's relative to the person that's eating the food, right? And their current level of state, or excuse me, their current state of health, their current level of fitness and whatever their goals or their pursuits are. Yeah, we, we've broken this down several times into the triangle of awareness. What are we trying to achieve here? Is it longevity, like a health and wellness goal? Is it a performance goal or is it an aesthetic goal? Is it a combination of all of those things? Because I think that's the home base. That's kind of your compass to come back to or your guiding, you know, your, your, sort of your guide rod to is the choice that I'm making right now um, good or not good. Helping you to achieve whatever that goal is at that time. So that's going to vary yeah. person to person. Yeah. hundred percent. So when somebody says unhealthy foods and quote unquote cravings, uh, what is this? And I think the, again, going back to the triangle, your current state of, of health and wellness, your, you know, the level of performance that you're trying to obtain, how hard your training program is, all that kind of thing. And then, and, or what the goal is from a aesthetics perspective could influence this very, this greatly, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you're, if your goal is to step on stage in a matter of months in a bikini or a pair of swim trunks, and you need to be absolutely peeled for that show, then it might not necessarily be unhealthy what you're choosing to eat, but is it is it going to impact you for the better or worse specific to your goal? Mm-hmm. Unhealthy versus counterproductive for your goal. So yeah, I mean, that could, yeah, that could vary person to person. I mean, for, I think like carbs get demonized. Uh, all the time. And, you know, for me as an endurance athlete, I I seek carbs. I'm hunting carbs. I'm, I'm looking, I have, I can eat a giant ass plate of pasta and I don't feel bad about it. For one moment, <laughs> right. but other people that might be the, you know, the antichrist. Yeah. I think so. Sugar, carbohydrate, refined sugar, for sure. Uh, sugar in, in and of itself, we talked about a lot of times on the show is just, is not inherently bad. I mean, our body needs sugar. It'll break things down ultimately to, to sugar in order to be utilized. So it needs it. It's just at what amount, at what times, what is your current state of health and fitness? That's one. Another one is fats. Uh, n- nobody really ever seems to demonize protein for a while there. It was, it was like, Oh, too much protein yep. is going to ruin your kidneys. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe like red meat, I think still gets kind of a bad rap as well. That's it's going to cause heart disease. It's high in saturated right. fat. Yeah, you're right. Especially when you start, you know, planting flags in different diet tribes and the, the, it's wild what stones will get thrown, you know, uh, acro- or shots will get fired across the bow of those planting different flags. I tend to not get involved in those conversations because it's a slippery slope. No matter if you're planting a flag in something, uh, that means you're probably neglecting to look at clearly something else. Um, and, and I'm not saying you can't have your convictions. And I'm not saying that what you're doing isn't working for the ways you need it to work in your life. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is I think you can be blinded very, very quickly by the 
agency that you gain by planting a flag. So again, that can quickly lead to, oh, well, what you're doing is unhealthy. Well, no, actually what you're doing is unhealthy. And any study can be manipulated or cherry picked for things that would uh, validate your position. That's not where I want to go with this. Let's get back to the question in terms of what could be affecting uh, the, my uh, psychologically be affecting these cravings. And I think you, you know, that's, this is one of those is already deciding something is unhealthy without a good basis for saying it one way or another. Um, but then as it relates to the cravings, there are a lot of things to, to consider here. And why are you craving things? And we're not going to get into deep physiology one, cause I'm not qualified to do that on this. We're talking about neuroscience at a lot of levels when we start talking about this. Um, I am not qualified to talk about that. I don't know if you no. guys are. Yeah, I, I think there's there could be definitely a physiological basis of your psychological cravings that a lot of people will argue, well, it's not just a purely mental thing. There is something going on biologically that is mm -hmm. driving these cravings. But I think when somebody asks this question, I think they're more so looking for, you know, kind of like lifestyle factors or, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on around me that is affecting my, you know, my, my cravings for unhealthy food, my shitty day at work, my stressful, you know, my stressful kids, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's uh, an easy place to kind of start that I think probably a lot of people can wrap their head around would be just the comfort foods that mm -hmm. we eat when we're feeling stressed. And Steven, I don't know, you know, like, in, I could tell you it was a lot when I was directly coaching people on the nutrition side of things with regard to when I ask the questions and they, they fill out a questionnaire and one of those things, do you mm -hmm. find yourself to eat, you know, stress eating mm -hmm. or, or eating when you're bored? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what are the types of things that, that they eat when they, when they eat or, or when those times occur? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Are these conversations that you're currently having with clients? And if so, how does the, some, what are they answer? Some people. Yeah. I mean, the, the current intake that I use does ask a question regarding emotional eating. Some people say that they do. Some people say that they do not. And, uh, I, I've definitely, definitely deal with individuals who are self-soothing through food or yes, also eating because they're bored, because they're anxious, because they're just, I, I've been working with someone who it's like a fidgeting thing. It's like a, it's like an oral fixation or like mm. a, my hands need to be busy. So I need to have like a bowl of chips or something like that while I'm watching TV. Otherwise like Ricky Bobby, like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> One of my it, favorite lines. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it varies person to person. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can sometimes begin to pick up patterns where, you know, maybe if I'm looking over someone's food log and I see kind of their trigger food or whatever. I'm like, oh, the, the chips, they're making a lot of appearances this week. The next time I have a session with them, I'm like, so how was your week? Right. <laughs> yeah. There are some clues that, there are some clues that suggest to me that maybe it wasn't the best week for you. And oftentimes, yes, they're, oh my God, my week sucked. So, it was yes, terrible. Stressful. Yeah. Yeah. So I think when you talk about stress, I mean, people can relate to, you know, stress, cortisol response, stress, cortisol response. And so, I, I, I want to be really careful, and this is the thing that I I warn people against quite frequently, and that is blaming your hormones for your habits or the things that aren't working for you, you know, in life. Your hormones are generally a symptom of something else, and you can impact those symptoms in many, many different ways. But when we look at cortisol, there is a there is a response, there is a stress response, right? And your body starts to that there are mechanisms within the body that 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 re will respond favorably to cortisol and those that, you know, will respond unfavorably. And when you put things in this, the, from a food perspective, you know, what people like, are you the sweet and crunchy or the salty, savory, mm -hmm. you know, type of person yeah. in terms of the food, the foods you reach for? What gets you going? Yeah. Like, <laughs> is it mac and cheese? Is it, you know, nachos? You know, what is it? Like, those are things that make people feel good. And they do, though, there is a reward system associated with foods that we eat. So, you know, you put that ice cream in your system, it's all the lights and bells, bells and, and whistles. whistles start going off in the brain. There's a little bit of a dopamine response that can happen there. Um, and it, but that to, to leave it at that and, and say that, oh, well, you're just trying to chase the dopamine response. 
that that isn't entirely true, and it's it's leaving a lot on the table. And again, going back to what I said before, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm not going to get into you know all the things that I've read, listened to, heard because I couldn't probably articulate them very well. What I will say is, if you get into the, you really want to nerd out on this shit, and I mean get into the deep neuroscience of this and the deep physiology, cellular physiology uh, of what's going on. Follow guys like Huberman. He talks about this all the time. This is what he, he's a neuroscientist. This was an ophthalmologist and a neuroscientist at Stanford. This is what he does. And there are hours and hours and hours of YouTube video and, um, and podcasts where he goes through this. And I will tell you this. This is one of the things I learned from him. And again, I'm paraphrasing. Um, so don't quote me on, on, on this. I'm paraphrasing. Basically, it's not in, in, the, in the example of sugar. Well, let's just talk about food. When you put food into your system, there's an insulin response, right? Or there's a, it will impact your blood sugar. It doesn't matter what it is, but it will be different for different people based on a lot of things mm -hmm. we've already talked about here. Um, you're going to have increased blood sugar a response. And then there's a response to how to deal with that or should be, that is an insulin response. So if your body is insulin resistant or is not producing enough insulin, then that triggers some other things, Right. Um, ultimately, that gets broken down into um, into our base currency that our body would want to run on from an ATP perspective. But we're talking about breaking things down into gl usable glucose so that it can be utilized in the cell in order to power power things. So I will tell you this: this is this is what he talks about. And he talks about it's not actually the taste that 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 is driving a lot of the behavior, like these cravings that we that. And when I say behavior, I mean the cravings. It's not actually the taste. It's not actually the sugar. So it's not, it, it could be protein. It could be fat. The humans tend to gravitate towards the sugary, fatty stuff, like a milkshake, you know, would be a, would be a good example. Delicious. Yeah, but a lot of these studies are actually done in mice, right? And they crave different things. They like, like sugar water. They will, they will drink that. But what they found is that it's not actually like the sugar or fatty tasting type of stuff that really drives the response. As they look deeper into the physiology, what they've seen is, is like whether they feed it to it through, you know, like ingest it so they can drink it, a mouse can drink it, or they actually feed it directly into the stomach through a tube. So it bypasses salivary glands, it bypasses the tongue and the taste buds, bypasses all that goes directly into the gut. It doesn't matter. It's what happens once it gets beyond that and how it feeds the neurons that send certain signals to other areas of the body. This is, again, this is neuroscience shit. So different people will respond differently to the foods that they put in their system or what they might crave. And uh, w there's a learning process from what I understand that goes on there that when you do this and when you feed those neurons, then you learn how you feel when you eat this particular thing. So for some people, it could be crayons. If you talk to the Marine Corps, <laughs> you know, like for other, so sorry for all my Marine buddies out there. Um, it, it could be the sugary, fatty milkshake. It could be the salty chips, you know, mm -hmm. the crunchy chips. It could be a lot of different things for people. But basically what you've done is you've trained your, your body, more specifically your brain, to respond in a certain way to this food or these types of food. So the flip side of that is that you can untrain yourself to do this. And how you do that, I think is dependent on who you are as an individual. But I think you know, the first thing that comes to mind is this is going to take a lot of, for lack of a better term, like intestinal fortitude and discipline, discipline yeah. to just go, I'm not going to do that. Um, and be able to be very aware that when you're having these cravings, there is some very deep stuff going on here and you're going to have to override that system, which is very, it could be like, very hard to do. I mean, I, I've had my own things in, in my, over my time, like in dieting for shows or being involved, heavily involved in, in like competitive athletics where I was really maybe restricting my calories or having a tough time just getting the calories in. And man, mm -hmm. like if I was stressed or having a bad day or I wasn't getting more specifically, like if I wasn't getting enough sleep, that was the biggest thing that would drive like it's late at night. I'm going for the sweet, crunchy, like a breakfast cereal was the thing. <laughs> like I could sit there on the couch at two in the morning and bury a box of <laughs> crunchy, bre sugary breakfast cereal. That's kind of where my, my, my body was. I was also able to burn those calories because of the volume and intensity of the training I was doing. So that's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. It was the cravings piece.
So, I mean, that's kind of my, 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 got you to the fucking moment. Yeah. It got me, got me through and it probably (laughs) had a little bit of a, you know, spiked my insulin and put me to sleep. You know, I wanted, but the point of this is, is I think what it's, what, what's, important for folks to understand when they're, if they're finding they have these, these cravings is first off, they're very normal, right? And this is a condition, right? Mm-hmm. You've conditioned it's yourself a as a conditioned response. Yes. Sorry. Not like a disease <laughs> um, or sickness, but you, you, it's a conditioned response to a lot of, you know, it could be a conditioned response to a lot of things. And so without over science, getting sciency about this, I think what's important is that you understand first that you have these cravings and that you can get out in front of that. How might you be able to manage these things? Manage your stress a little bit better, right? Uh, making sure, and how do we do that? Well, let's make sure we're getting enough sleep or we've got a properly organized exercise plan. Uh, we're doing things and putting ourselves in situations from a social perspective that stimulate us in a positive way rather than a negative way. I mean, these are all maybe idealistic things, but I think, you know, like if you really sat down and thought about it, they would be impactful. Yeah, no, I'm just sitting here thinking about like having to peel back the layers, as you would say, as far as, you know, what's going on in life? What are the driving forces as far as why are you feeling stressed or why are you fatigued? Are you getting enough food? Are you are you planning your days out to where you're making sure that you're getting enough calories in, you mm-hmm. know, to get you through the day? Um, and, and like you said, not necessarily blaming it on hormones, um, you know, for, for individuals that there are so many other factors there. And it's just, it's sitting down and recognizing, you know, life, what's happening in life right now and making sure that you're organized. Yeah. And I think getting ahead of it, you had, I think that's a, that's a key when I'm trying to work through this with my clients. And an example of this was I had this conversation, uh, just yesterday with, uh, with one of my clients who had, uh, she was, she knew that she was going to be going out to a restaurant, Mm -hmm. Buffalo Wild Wings to be specific. Um, and obviously we know what kind of food is at Mm -hmm. Buffalo Wild Wings. It's like wings and burgers and generally quote unquote unhealthy food. And she had a plan in mind that she was going to get whatever salad. And she had thought about this enough in advance that she even had salad dressing that she was going to bring with her so that she could add her own dressing to the salad. And so she had thought about this. She had a plan in place. When we get to the day of, she has breakfast and then she is very busy throughout the day and she gets to the restaurant. She has this plan in mind. She's ready to execute this plan. She gets the burger and the fries. Mm. And she was, she was upset at herself. She felt guilty about it. She felt the, you know, the, the post quote unquote binge uh, shame about it. And as we kind of broke it down, what it boiled down to was that she had had breakfast that was, you know, whatever. It was a decent breakfast with protein, with, you know, some fiber in there, a fairly satiating breakfast. And this was at eight or nine in the morning. And then she didn't eat the entire day yeah. up to, you know, six o'clock. Fucking and, wings and burgers sound pretty good yeah, after yeah, you're yeah, gone yeah. for like 10 hours, no eating. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And she, I was, you know, kind of breaking down the scenario to her and she was like, yeah, I was just really hungry. And I'm like, yeah, I would be too. Weird. And, yeah. and yeah, when you get to that point, you're going to get, you're going to go for what sounds the most satiating it that mm-hmm. even though she had this entire plan in place and even had like the salad dressing in the holster, she still went for the burger really just because she had skipped lunch. She was really hungry. A salad wasn't going to cut it mm-hmm. in yeah. that moment. Mm-hmm. So she was thinking like, Oh, I'm, I'm a slave to my cravings. I'm like, no, you were just really hungry mm-hmm. that you had had a plan in place, but you, there was just a step that, you know, kind of took you in the wrong direction a little bit. Oh, you know, so I'm listening to you and I saw um, Cassidy, it, um, mm-hmm. she had posted something about- Cassidy Dixon. Yeah, yeah. she had posted something about, because we're coming Love up on, on Thanksgiving and how, you know, to better manage your food and your energy and um, around Thanksgiving meal. And so making sure that you're eating throughout the day, mm-hmm. you know, having a solid breakfast and a solid lunch before you get to dinner. So then you can have more self-control. You can still enjoy the Thanksgiving dinner, but you're not like inhaling everything at once. We had that exact right? conversation because <laughs> that was her next concern was, right. well, now Thanksgiving is coming up. I'm worried that I'm going to binge. I'm worried that I'm going to like go ham. I'm like, well, you know, start the day by eating, mm-hmm. put protein and fiber first, put these most satiating things first, and you can still enjoy yourself. You don't yep. have to have Thanksgiving FOMO. And you're not required 
to binge eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the, this is interesting. This is coming up. So when this episode drops, it's going to be the Monday after Thanksgiving. So we'll mm -hmm. sort of miss the pre pre game here uh, with regard to that. But I, you you mentioned the, this. A lot of this revolves around number one planning. Right. And very basic things, which I'll, I'll circle back to, but also social gatherings. And I think a lot of people kind of fall victim to the social thing. Um, I mean, I certainly do. Like in growing up, like family gatherings, it was all centered around the food. And mm -hmm. I really look forward to it. Everybody does. And that's what I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is only my most favorite fucking holiday <laughs> of the year. Mm -hmm. And I don't go into it thinking about anything with regard to control for that day. In fact, I get wildly out of control on Thanksgiving <laughs> and I don't feel bad about it. Like I, I eat way too much. I literally can eat myself sick to the, to the extent that I don't eat dessert on Thanksgiving. I actually eat it the next day because I don't have room for it. <laughs> I drink way too much. It's that day where I, you know, there's cocktails and there's beer and, you know, we're, we're hanging out, we're talking, we're having a good time. We're watching games on TV, all that stuff. Uh, you know, that's Thanksgiving for me. And so if, I think it is that it's that way for a lot of people, but if you're managing yourself throughout the course of the week and the months and the year, you know, in a more, let's just say, uh, controlled or disciplined way. And I don't want to make it all about discipline when it comes to cravings, because again, there are some really deep rooted, powerful mm -hmm. things that are influencing these things in terms of uh, internally. Okay. I'm not saying externally. However, there are things externally that influence the internal, like hyper palatable foods, you know, that, that tastes yep. so good when you put them and go back to the chips. Like who doesn't like a fucking Dorito? Mm -hmm. Stick that in your mouth Let's, and it's like, yeah. what is this going on? Right? That, that kind of stuff. But internally there are things going on. So if you can stay out in front of it and you're controlling that more throughout the week than or months, days, whatever, and you get to Thanksgiving, you don't have to think about it. Dude, go off. You got some wiggle room. Yeah. Go off. One day, one one bad day isn't going to kill you. And in terms of those cravings, satisfy them all for God's sakes. <laughs> um, you know, just go there. Um, but to to I think in when we kind of wrap this all up and kind of, as Steve would say, tie a bow on this, I think there's some very basic things that can help you with your cravings. First, eating the right amount of calories throughout the day can help with reducing cravings. I'm not saying it fixes it. I'm saying it can, it can help with that. Um, and what I mean by that is meeting your total daily energy need for whatever, wherever you are in time, activity, space, whatever. So that's a great place to start. Secondly, within there, we talk about this all the time, the adequacy of the macronutrients that you're eating or the types of foods that you're eating in terms of your vitamin and mineral profiles and, and the things that come along uh, with proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Like if you're balancing those things, those can often help uh, curb cravings. Uh, and then we, we, we talk about this all the time, and that is the type of diet that you eat uh, matters here. So if you're purely carnivore, right? You're, you may be craving like the higher fatty meats. Like you might want uh, that ribeye steak, you know, when you probably should be eating more sirloin because of fat to protein ratios or whatever, depending on your needs. I'm not saying ribeye is bad. If I'm going to eat a steak, it's <laughs> probably going to be a ribeye, right? Um, most or a good deal of the time. So don't, don't take that the wrong way. I'm just saying like you might be craving the fattier steak, but if you're getting your protein in throughout the day and it's much in, in, you know, you're, you're meeting your need, then you might not have that, that, that protein you're training your, or that craving you're, you're, you're training yourself that way. Uh, and we've talked about sleep and stress management. So important, particularly to start the day and to end the day. If you not sleeping and then you're waking up, you know, after poor sleep, if any sleep at all, we already know your insulin sensitivity is going to be off. Your Cortisol response is all, all out of whack, and that can drive other things uh, in terms of behaviors, feelings, not working out, um, all kinds of stuff. And then, obviously, we mentioned the exercise. So, if you're putting those things in place, that can help manage your manage your cravings, uh, help with the management of your cravings a little bit. And if you're and if you're having them, uh, the next thing I would say in terms of managing is note them, understand what they are, mm -hmm. and to your point, Stephen, pre-plan, be out in front of that. Mm -hmm. You know, the salad before Buffalo Wild Wings. I don't know. That would be a tough thing for me to do, man. If, if I, I, I'm, I, I don't go to Buffalo Wild Wings. I've been there once. Disaster pants, oh, to say the least. And, <laughs> and I felt like shit. So uh, I, I just haven't been there. But there are places that I could say, like, you take me to this place, like, and put a salad in front of me. I'm eating off everybody talks? else. Yeah, I'm eating off <laughs> of everybody else's plate or something, you know, that kind of thing. So they're very natural. Yeah. And I think another way, I mean, another tip that I would say is to, uh, you know, kind of play the tape forward. Um, most of the time, these are cycles. These are, 
you know, conditions responses as we've talked about. And you've probably experienced where this, where satisfying this craving or following this craving takes you. Mm-hmm. And if you're serious about whatever goal it is you have, you can kind of think ahead, okay, I've been in this scenario before. What happened when mm-hmm. I, when I ate the burger or when I, you know, when I sought out this, uh, you know, whatever I'm craving, did I feel better about it afterwards? No, I probably felt like shit. I felt guilty. I felt, you know, maybe physically upset stomach, whatever the case may be. So as you're kind of in the craving cave, you can, you know, play the tape forward and think, okay, what, what will happen if I end up satisfying this craving in the way that I want to satisfy it? And you can kind of on a psychological level, you know, kind of make sense of it and get some perspective on what's going to happen. I if like I, that. if I go through this. Yeah, I so. do too. And, and that's not something you decide to do in the moment. Mm-hmm. You, that takes a lot of prep work and a lot of practice. And mm-hmm. just because you weren't able to do it the first time doesn't mean you're a complete failure or loser or whatever else you, you know, you, you, up, up, you take that information that you gained and you apply it to the same question the next time. Cause the question doesn't really change. Like, you know, exactly. That was, that was how I wrapped up the conversation with the client was okay. You know, don't beat yourself up so much. This is someone who tends to beat herself up quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Like, don't be so hard on yourself. This is now feedback. It's not failure. This is feedback that you've gotten. And now if a similar situation arises in the past, now you, now you can play the tape forward. Okay. Last time when I didn't eat any lunch, when I got to the restaurant, there was no fucking chance I was going to order the salad. Mm-hmm. That situation arises again. Now you're prepared. Now you can make an alternative choice. Can you explain the benefits and risks of high intensity interval training for various fitness levels? All right. So hit training. Um, love hit training. I also hate it mm-hmm. uh, at the same time. Um, I hate it. Like I have a personal Love, uh, hate, love hate, love hate with it for a few reasons. One, as an as a person that trains, and and how that makes me feel in terms of getting into the the pain cave. It's not that I don't enjoy pushing myself, but there are times during the process where I hate it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I also hate it because it's g- gained a ton of popularity. I think it's misunderstood, and as a result uh, of how effective it can be, because it is hu- it can be hugely effective in a couple of different ways. Um, it has, I think people have overdone it. They've, let's just say they've abused it or misused it. Let's just say they've misused HIT training and as a result, abused their bodies. And we, we've seen that uh, in spades over the last several years, um, particularly in, in, in particular, let's just say modalities of, of, of fitness out there, brands, if you will, mm-hmm. which we can talk about. So, um, but again, I love it because of how effective it can be, how efficient it can be. And uh, yeah, I like to nerd out kind of on the science behind it and, and what is efficient. But the specific question here is, is like, what are the risks associated with um, f- for people specific to their fitness level and where they're coming in? Benefits and risks, yeah, right? Benefits and risks. Yeah. So I just mentioned a couple of benefits and I just mentioned a couple of risks on a high level. Let's, let's break it down. So let's talk about HIIT training. What is HIIT training? High intensity interval training. Right. So, I mean, it's um, working at a, an intensity that is, uh, what would you say as far as like I'm gonna say heart it's a, rate, max heart rate? I'm going to say it's at your absolute maximum. It's the maximum output that you can maintain for, a, it's going to be for a very, very short, short period of time because you're on the clock, followed by a very controlled short rest period uh, in general, and then repeat that high output, that max effort for another short period. Yeah. And then, and then the, whatever rest necessary to, in order to be able to repeat that activity again at the highest level. So an example would be like, um, a 30 seconds on and what, four minutes, five minutes off. Right. So max out, recovery. Yeah. That could be one. Yeah. So it could be a one to one, a two to one, so, or a one to two. So 30 seconds on to one minute off. Right. And you could, you could repeat that. It depends on what your training program is. And I think that's the thing is like it gets used, but it's not very organized. It's just, as, it's being used as a, ma- as a, as a, a means, framework. yeah, as a means to burn the maximum amount of calories you possibly can the shortest period of time, which is a benefit. Like you can, you can do that when it, when it's applied properly. Um, so, you know, the, I think it got a lot of, you and I talked about this, Cece and I talked about this on a previous podcast where we were talking about heart rate zones. It got a lot of uh, attention um, probably in the last 10, 10 years or so uh, when you look at certain certain modalities. There are certain brands of fitness, look at like Orange Theory when in working into the orange zone. Uh, 
and things like CrossFit, where we look at like what what is the water of the day and that maximum mm-hmm. output you can do um, in in that amount of time. So, or in a in a specific or given amount of time. Basically, here's some 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 things with 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 hit training. One, you're going to be on the clock, so the the timing is important. And why? Because you're trying to tap into certain energy systems, uh, specifically your anaerobic uh, glycolysis system, mm-hmm. it, which is kind of your your body's last line of energy after it runs out, where it can't use things like and it can't buffer uh, lactic acids or, or lactic acid or lactate, and it and it can no longer use oxygen as its main source of fuel. From a cellular perspective, you are. On the clock, you have very little of this fuel available until your body can regenerate that fuel. So you've reached into the pain cave or deep into the fuel tank to exhaust what you have. Now, the more fit you are, the the more efficient you'll be at buffering the waste products that come while during this exercise. The, the, the Maybe the more oxygen carrying capacity you have in order to perform this exercise longer during the timed portion that you're you're actually performing it. And the recovery time, if I didn't already mention that, uh, can be uh, oftentimes quicker. So uh, based on your fitness level, those, those are things that you, you might expect. For the advanced athlete, uh, utilizing HIIT training can be extraordinarily uh, beneficial for, for training to do things like surges. So if you're like a cyclist, um, it's that surge or that sprint at the end or that passing that person on a hill, hill climb and yeah, the kick. Yeah. yeah the, the running, it's that mm-hmm. last for the 800 meter. It's the last 200 meters of the race, mm-hmm. right? If it's the 5k, 5k runner, you might actually be working at a high level, you know, we'll, we'll call it like zone four, zone five, you know, for that, for that amount of time. But as a marathon runner, you're not, you're reserving, you need to reserve a little bit for the end. You mentioned mm-hmm. the kick. So depending on where you are, uh, you know, as an athlete, what your specific, uh, uh, you know, goals are or your event is you. You'd be managing hit training within your within your program very very specifically. Um, so uh, again, very effective at building uh, anaerobic threshold. That is your body's ability to push at the at max level. Uh, it can also be very helpful in terms of if we're looking to burn maximum calories during a given period of time. It can help with that as well. Or and then it, after and then. After which we, yeah, what when we we talked about post uh, exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC, um, how long your body burns those calories for, or excuse me, the rate at which the, the body will burn calories based on the debt that you've created during the the, ex, the programmed exercise that you did at that or during that hit training. So, those are, those are some benefits that that can come on, come along with it. What what else have I missed? Uh, for benefits, yeah. I, I mean, it can yeah, be, I mean, you talked about the VO2 max as far as the surge. Um, you know, you become more, I guess, efficient. Your your heart can become more efficient mm-hmm. at pumping blood to the extremities or to your muscles. So we're talking about, you know, contractility. We're talking about stroke volume of mm-hmm. your heart. Things that we've talked about in a previous podcast. Yep. Yeah, I think you've pretty much hit it all. I mean, those are those are all good things if you're trying to be a performance athlete, right? What what are the downsides, right? And particularly based on your fitness level, so. One of the things with with hit training is it's generally high impact, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you are you are pushing at max levels. So whether that's a sprint on a bike, whether that's a sprint, you know, on the road or on the trail, whether it's uh, maybe a ski erg or something like that, uh, it could be swimming. Maybe it's a modality within the weight room. Yep, that's the next one I was going to get to when we talk about those maybe those brands or those those modes of uh, of exercise when look at like CrossFit as an example, a lot of HIIT training in CrossFit where we're, we're combining very skilled movements, gymnastics movements, Olymp- Olympic weight, weightlifting movements, uh, calisthenic, high, high demand calisthenic movements in a exercise program with speed, yeah. <laughs> with speed, right. And oftentimes with, uh, uh external loads, uh, because you're performing, uh, at the max effort level, and you are on the clock with regard to how long your body will be able to maintain that. The skills portion is something that's important to look at and that I would relate to as a risk. Mm -hmm. So the higher the skilled movement, the higher the skill in the movement uh, during the HIIT training that you're doing, the higher propensity for a faulty movement pattern, 
uh, and or just fatigue, which would then compromise. create an overcompensation, yeah. which could then create compromise, which then could lead to overuse uh, injuries and or and or particularly like or an acute injury. And so that's definitely something to be aware of. So when we're looking at HIIT training, it is much harder on the tissues and the joints uh, of the body, which obviously could be problematic if you're doing it a lot or you're constantly in debt from like a recovery perspective from all of your workouts and you're you're driving to this hit training um, on a on a, uh, a let's just say on a on a regular or very very frequent basis I think would be the would be the the key there. Yeah, for for that type of training, I mean, you need to have a base, a foundation of some type of endurance before you even begin a hit training. Yeah, I think we've talked about this on the on the show a lot, just about skill, right? And so, in order to, I mean, there are some things that you can do that require very little skill in order to get the benefits of hit training. So you could hit train, say, on a bicycle. It takes very little skill mm -hmm. to do that, say, on a stationary bike. However, if you're on a if you're on a, a outside on a road bike or a mountain bike, that's that's a little bit of a different different thing. But it doesn't take a lot of skill to do that. Um, but if you're doing it in the pool as a swimmer, it does take some skill so that you're not so you're still staying efficient in, in swimming at the at the stroke that you're using uh, versus just flopping around on the water because you can be moving them. <laughs> you can be moving really fast, but you might not be going very far, <laughs> right? Um, so skills are important. So I think skill development is a uh, uh, prerequisite for hit training, and and unfortunately, we see a lot of people applying hit training principles uh, to skilled movements when they lack both maybe a level of fitness, but more importantly, a level of skill in order to maintain that without getting getting again creating some overcompensation, maybe overuse, and ultimately um, creating uh, potential injury or just a, a debt and a faulty movement pattern that could be detrimental down, down the line. So that is, that is, that is a potential risk. Uh, it's probably inappropriate for most novice exercisers. You, you don't, I, I, again, I would ask, we always have to ask like, what is the goal? Like, why would you be doing this? And I think most of the time for most people, it's fair to say they're doing this because they want to burn more calories. More specifically, they want to get into the fat burning zone which is bullshit. There is no fat burning zone. There are energy systems that we work through. We're working in and out of those at any given time. We have covered this before on previous podcasts. This is the stuff nobody really wants to sit and listen to because it's boring. Just tell me how to burn the fat, Scott. <laughs> you need to burn calories and there will be some fat and there will be some sugar and other things like pyruvate and, and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, bottom line there is, is people are choosing it in order to do that. And the more is better principle is absolutely not what you want to be applying here. There's a lot of risk in, a, in, a, in, a, in applying that. Um, when we get into like athletics and you, you look at um, endurance athletes or even um, more power athletes uh, and explosive type athletes, you could compare like, um, you compare like a football player, even like to a triathlete what percentage of their uh, their training program should be dedicated to uh, hit training versus maybe more of the endurance type training or, or skills based stuff? If I'm talking about like the football player, um, how much? What 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 should the percentages be be at? I would I would say like for the football player, it should be eighty percent. You know, mm -hmm. strength, stability. Uh, stamina, endurance, uh, in order to to uh, play your position or do your job on the field, and maybe twenty percent high intensity yeah. uh, uh, interval training um, to build th that capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not talking about weight training in the room or, or in the weight room. This is this is that is not hit training, right? If we're, if we're looking to build max power mm -hmm. and strength, that that's not hit training. We're we're working at a very high. Uh, intensity level and heart heart rate zone, but we're not doing it for minutes on end and then recovering to get you know back what we can in order to do it again. We hopefully no NFL player is doing that. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. I would think it'd be very positional dependent as well. Like sure. maybe a running back would do this, but not necessarily your defensive lineman. I don't know. Yeah, I think <laughs> at, at different points during the year or during your your macro, meso, and micro cycles, you know, you, you'd be doing different things. But this is not something they're frequently doing mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. If you broke it down over the course of the year, it may be as much as twenty percent of their training volume would be that. The rest, eighty percent, would include all of these other things. Mm -hmm. So. 
that's something to think about. So as a, as a, um, as a novice, you know, exerciser, somebody with maybe very little fitness, look, just getting on the treadmill and walking at level seven with an incline two for you could be very intense enough. enough. You need to build a certain amount of your engine and capacity in order to be able to perform this stuff well. So that's a risk or a, mm-hmm. excuse me, a, a recommendation, but also again, with the skills thing that there's, I think there's risk in that, uh, for, for the novice to intermediate or excuse me, for the intermediate exerciser, who's looking to, you know, build some capacity, lose a little body fat and whatever in, in incorporating that into your, into your, your, your program, maybe one to two times a week mm-hmm. in short intervals, maybe eight minute type, uh, hit, hit sessions or, or even less, or maybe as much as 15 minutes, you could totally do that. And then for the, for the advanced exerciser, I think that is going to be even more dependent on what your goal, what your event is or what you're trying, trying to obtain. So again, like go back to like the triathlete as they start to get closer to their event that they've been training for, you know, during the year, uh, you know, maybe six to eight weeks out, maybe you start to see a little bit more hit training taking place to build on top of that base, that engine that they've built throughout the year. Um, and it'll start with, let's make sure we're, we've got our skills where they need to be, and then we'll ramp this up. And then as they get within a week to two weeks from their, from their event, they'll actually taper off a little bit so that they're not going into this recovery or, or, or excuse me, recovery debt and they're primed for, for their event. So, um, if you want to hear more about uh, endurance uh, building through um, through your heart rate zones, and we do talk a little bit about HIT training there, it's episode 119. It's entitled Endurance Building Multi-Series, Demystifying Heart Rate Zone Training. What are the key considerations when transitioning to a plant-based or vegan diet for fitness? Somebody's thinking about transitioning to plant-based. My question would be why? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I, I'm always going to ask that question. I really love to know that question. Why? Maybe they're asking for a friend. Well, it's healthier because it's plants. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone knows that. The the, the question. All the glyphosate or yeah. glyphosates or whatever you freaking you call it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what a, I think you meant to say was a slippery slope. <laughs> I mean, we start getting into things. I, this question uh, is interesting. Like somebody's th- maybe thinking about moving to plant-based diet specific for uh, improving their fitness. Yes, I would love to know the question why, uh, and you know, you know, what is their thought process. And whenever I hear somebody has planted a flag somewhere, particularly on the vegan, uh, vegetarian, plant-based side of things, I think it's important in t- to to understand what kind of a conversation I'm going to have with this person, or let's just say how this is going to proceed. And when I ask the question, I'll actually, I'll often preload it if I don't get that immediate response here with, in the why, with, is this more of a, is this more of a, a, a dietary preference? And, you know, because you're looking for a performance output or specific health output of this or, and, or is this more specifically centered around some morals and ethics? Yeah. Is it, yeah. Is this a matter of principle for you or is this actually based on just nutrition exercise, uh, you know, improving your, your health and that's it. Yeah. Cause either way, our job is to try to educate and help inform a, a client so that they can make the right decisions for themselves in order to get them to wherever it is they're looking to go. And if this is a principles based thing, then that is going to tailor how I maybe present some information. Um, because if I already know they've made in their belief system, we are, I am not eating an animal. I'm not touching anything that's animal based. Well, that, that cuts out a lot of, of, uh, maybe the information that I may be giving specific to, uh, food sources that people could be eating, how to maybe, uh, tackle, you know, uh, their, their fitness goals through nutrition, uh, versus, you know, something that's like, no, this is more or less like I'm trying to do this from a health perspective, and I may be able to make some compare and some uh, some compare and contrast without completely turning somebody off or offending them because they just don't or can't handle the conversation around animal products. That's a thing. So I think people can have an emotional, maybe even a a, um, a spiritual or religious uh, connection to why they're eating this way. And so for that, I you know I just want to understand where we're coming from here. So I, I was just putting that out there. Uh, but moving to plant based specific to fitness, um, what are some of the key things that uh, people should understand if they're moving that direction? Uh, Stephen, where do you want to start? 
Well, I think the protein conversation is where that conversation always goes, the the animal protein versus plant-based protein conversation. So if you are moving to a plant-based diet for whatever reason you're doing that, the way you approach your protein consumption is going to be different. And there's going to be different considerations that you need to keep in mind. Um, I am of the opinion that you're going to have to think a little bit harder. You're going to have to work a little bit harder in terms of how you are acquiring your daily protein needs. Yeah. Uh, you brought up protein. Interesting is kind of the first thing uh, that I think is really where a lot of the conversation centers around. I would have to agree with you on that. I also think that uh, there is that conversation is still the same conversation we're having with the omnivore or, yeah, exactly. or on the other side, right? That may be eating all, you know, both plant and animal uh, foods. There's, we're still going to have to, we still ha have to address the protein thing. And we're addressing that very, usually 99.9 .9 to infinity percent of the time. The people just need to get enough of that. Uh, and it's educating them on how much they need. So jumping back to the plant-based thing, it's just understanding that there are major differences between plant-based and animal-based protein. You want to cover yeah. those at kind of yeah. a high level? That man actually was asked this question in a consultation today, uh, a supplement consult where she was, she's currently taking plant-based protein uh, because she kind of tends to lean towards a vegetarian diet in mm -hmm. general. And she asked, well, do I need to have plant or do I need to have animal-based protein? And I was like, well, no, not necessarily, but let me try to educate you a little bit on the differences between them, which boils down to animal protein is going to be a complete protein source. It's all the essential amino acids are already there, no matter what animal protein source you are consuming, eggs, beef, chicken, fish, turkey, whatever. Those are always going to be complete protein sources. Whereas plant-based protein sources, there are a couple of complete protein sources and there are some kind of, there's a little bit of debate on that, whether like quinoa is a complete protein source or uh, edamame is a complete protein source. But most plant-based protein sources are not going to contain all nine essential amino acids in say whatever, just a pea protein mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. So you are going to need to do some mixing and matching as far as your protein sources. So the answer that I provided to uh, to this individual was, you can continue taking your plant-based protein, but when you are maybe purchasing a plant-based uh, protein, when you go do so, or based on my recommendation, look for one that has a combination of different plant protein sources so that you're more likely to be checking all the boxes in terms of the amino acids that you need. So you just have to, it's just that little extra step. You got to think about it a little bit harder. Yeah. And to be clear, you're, you're, when you say the plant-based protein, you're mentioning like a uh, protein powder, right? Yes. Like, so like a, so like a, mm -hmm. a supplement powder in order to in, put on top in, of the foods in, that are in this instance. Yeah. Yes. But if you are, if you're talking about whole food sources, mm -hmm. you, there are still going to be fewer complete protein sources that are plant-based. There's only yeah. a couple. Um, whereas all animal protein is a complete protein source. Right. So again, yeah, the protein conversation as it relates to fitness, which is what mm -hmm. this question was about. That's, that's an important one. It's an yeah, important distinction. I think that's usually what people tie like fitness protein. Like, you know, that's, that's the conversation is, you know, I'm, I'm looking to, okay, fitness, I'm looking to build muscle. I'm looking for athletic performance. Protein is obviously, it's very foundational no matter what you're doing, but it's this, especially foundational when it comes to exercise performance. Yeah. Uh, so consideration, like you, you need to be ready for this, you know, do your research, be on top of things, ask lots of questions, go through a supplement uh, protocol consultation with Steven to help guide you and in, maybe into the right places because it just like anything else, again, if we're looking at this other, you know, like eating style, maybe like omnivore or carnivore or whatever, like people have their preferences and their tastes and things like that. I mean, you could be rice bran protein, pea protein. Uh, there's all different, there's all different types of, of, of stuff out there and yeah, that might not sit well in your gut either so too. That's another thing to talk about, right? Because and same as like whey or uh, egg or you know beef protein on the other side of the the fence here. That not all those things sit well with everybody. So finding what's going to work best for you could take some time. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, if you're making a hard switch to that, uh, that is going from say more of a omnivore type diet or meat based diet. Uh, animal protein based diet to more vegetarian or vegan, we'll call it plant based. Uh, you should be, you, you need to be ready for the, when we look at, sorry, when we look at uh, the 
the triangle of awareness here in terms of what we're trying to to accomplish. Is this a longevity goal? Is this an aesthetics goal or performance goal? I mentioned that before in the other question. But we also got to look at this, like w- the way we relate back to like supplements and taking care of our systems so that we can be running at the optimal level we possibly can in order to process what all the stuff that we put in our bodies from a food perspective produce as much energy as we can to get through the day without producing too much and store it as fat, to run our endocrine systems, our cardiovascular systems, you know, like all the different things in our body so that they're, they're running well. Uh, there is a volume of, of things that need to go in in order for us to maintain those things. And if you're cutting out a major source of food, which then also provides macronutrients, which then also provides micronutrients, um, you're going to have to backfill that with something. Right. And that something could be is likely going to be a higher volume of food for which may not have the same nutrient density. Going back to like the protein thing as a as an example. Like I'm gonna have to eat a lot more food or start onboarding a lot more powders mm-hmm. uh, in order to make up for what I may or may not be getting from not just a protein source, a caloric uh, uh or a calorie source as well. And that could going back to gut, liver. Uh, brain, that could have some impacts on some of those systems. Some digestive upset. Yeah. A a real world example was someone that I was speaking with a couple of weeks ago who his primary goal was to bulk. He just wanted to put on mass. He just wanted to put on size. That was his, that was his thing. Um, He was a vegetarian. I didn't really ask him why he was vegetarian. It didn't really matter for the conversation that we were having. He was just looking for some input as far as that goes. And I was asking him to take me through what he's eating on a daily basis, what his protein goal was. He had a pretty good idea of, you know, what his macro breakdown, what he was looking to, what he was looking to hit. It was it was 200, uh, 200 and change as far as his protein consumption. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, okay, so you're vegetarian. Um, I'm, he might've mentioned that he doesn't really like eggs. Um, so that, again, that cuts out something else too. Mm-hmm. Um, so really plant forward. And he's taking me through how he is hitting his protein goal. And it was, oh yeah, a scoop of, a scoop of plant protein powder, another scoop of plant protein powder. I think he said three like shakes that he makes a day. Mm-hmm. And then he was mentioning that for dinner, he has a, uh, like a stir fry was what he was saying that there was like some beans, some legumes involved all in all, as he's taking me through what he's eating on a day-to-day basis, I'm like, this guy's gut and his toilet must be in, in duress, like a lot often. (laughs) And without me even prompting, or I forget maybe how we got onto the conversation, (laughs) he was like. Yeah, I have a lot of flatulence. Just straight up said that. He said that. And he said flatulence specifically. He's like, yeah, I have a lot of flatulence. And I was like, mm-hmm. do you now? Weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, that, goes, that was exactly what was going through my mind was that this guy's gut is whew, like this. He's, he's doing a number. But a lot of fiber. He's hitting. Yeah. Yeah. That was, we did not talk about that. I was like, I have a feeling you're hitting your fiber. Yeah. Uh, your fiber needs are being met and then some. Um, but that was, and his question, you know, was do like, how can I hit this protein goal without consuming this so much volume? Mm-hmm. Um, and he actually mentioned how time consuming just eating his dinner is. He's like, I would like for me, I would like for it to not take 45 minutes just, for to, me power to, it just to eat my food yeah. because I have to consume like so much volume. I'm like, well, uh, you know, you're a pretty good sized guy. You have a pretty high protein goal. This is kind of the the consideration that you have to keep in mind, this is kind of how you have to do it if you're not getting animal protein, which is going to be a denser source of protein. You're going to have to consume a lot of powders and like a shitload of beans. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing that we we try to discourage even the person that isn't eating plant-based from doing is, is depending on those, excuse me, depending on those powders to meet their protein need. It should be a very small percentage of the whole uh, in the end. Like, a, if we need somebody like, if it's helpful for somebody right up front, you know, and they're, they're, they're taking in, you know, 30%, 40% of their protein through powder. Okay. Well, let's maybe try to cut that back 10% at a time and try to whittle it down. So we're not, you know, maybe it's more like 20, 25% at the, you know, uh, in a, in the near future, if we could eliminate that altogether, then we would, I, but I, you know, I'll be the first to say, like, I think most people can benefit from using some type of a protein supplement. Again, 
plant-based or not, because it is difficult to, you know, when you're trying to eat the proper amount of calories on a daily basis with whatever schedule you have, with whatever training uh, schedule you have and all those, all the things that go into life, like can be very helpful. But when you're dependent on them to that, to that extent, obviously you're going to be lacking uh, quite a few things that, that you would be getting from a whole sourced food, uh, whether it's again, plant-based or animal-based. And so to think like your 40 grams of protein powder, let's just say you're using whey protein or pea protein, your 40 grams of powder is going to be number one, absorbed, right? And, and number two, utilized in the way, you know, that you need and want it to be, to be utilized versus again, the non-plant-based person eating the chicken, the steak, the fish, the whatever, or this person over here eating tons of beans, legumes, trying to combine uh, some grains and things like that in order to make that. You sticking that in your system is going to provide you with a lot more, right? Micronutrients, also whatever you're onboarding with the protein source. So that could be hormones, that could be uh, chemicals, that could be pesticides, it could be herbicides on both sides, you know, as you're putting that in there. So when you start looking at plant-based stuff, I think part of it is it becomes a little bit, you have to become a little bit more aware of the quality and the source of the, the plant-based stuff. I think you really want to understand where that stuff is coming from. Uh, you know, and, and what I mean by that is the quality of the produce, the quality of the grains, what might be onboarded with those things uh, is, is important to note, uh, especially because now you're eating such a, uh, or you'll be eating a higher volume of it. Um, and so to go back to this guy who's trying to get it all through through plant based food, two hundred grams of protein, plant based food. Would I can't be, imagine. Man, I'd be miserable by the end of the week trying. To, I, if yeah. even if challenged to try to do that on a, on a week would be would just destroy me. My my question would be then too. You know, how many more calories is he consuming when having to hit the markers that he needs to hit for his protein? Yeah. yeah. So you know, because some of those plant based proteins, it's calorically dense. You but know, it's not protein dense. Or it's not, not right. protein yeah. dense. Yeah. Right. The percentage of protein is not as high as yeah. an animal source. Yeah. Right. And so you're having to eat a higher volume of food. And then in some cases comes out, you're onboarding more calories right. to get the same the equivalent protein. protein that you would get from something on the other side yeah, of the I'm aisle. I'm just thinking like quinoa, you know, how much, how much protein's in it and then how much you are actually consuming and then what the caloric, you know, mm -hmm. Association yeah. is there. I, I think there's something to, yeah, there, I, that is a, that would be a concern for me if I was moving that direction and not being a ruminant animal that has the uh, intestinal tract in order to be able to process that. And you were, I think we were inadvertently mentioning that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that could be very, very tough on the gut, not just from, you got fiber in there, it's creating, you know, a lot of prebiotics. So you've got all this stuff floating around and it creates gas um, and could be, could in, in, increase to digest or, uh, excuse me, indigestion. But what you've got is you just got a full gut all the time in order to, you know, manage the caloric intake as well as the mac macro and micronutrient intake all the time. Our bodies really aren't designed for that, to be eating constantly. We covered that on um, a little bit on the inter intermittent fasting uh, podcast, just kind of in terms of what is really considered a fast and, you know, uh, what the the job of the digestive tract is, how certain medications and foods and things are impacting that that thing. But that's you're asking your body to do a lot of work all the time. So when we talk about like rest and digest uh, periods versus you know periods of of activity. Uh, that could that's something to be cons to to consider if you're if you're doing this for fitness and let's say you love to ride or run. Uh, and you're trying to get all this food in at the same time. This could be problematic uh, with regard to having that volume of food in the digestive tract while you're trying to perform, particularly if you're doing like distant stuff, long, drawn out workouts, two, sure. three, four hours at a time. Uh, that could be tough. Yeah, feeling just feeling that volume in your gut all the time, just kind of having bubble guts all the right. time. Yeah, it's so, I mean, it again, it's not, I think this conversation has come up quite a bit and you see, you know, what the, uh, with that movie, uh, game changers that was mm -hmm. basically plant-based propaganda, but that's another conversation, um, that, you know, oh, the, you can be a, a plant-based athlete or a plant-based bodybuilder or a plant, you know, it is possible. Uh, it, it's not like plant-based protein is necessarily inferior. Um, at the end agree. of the day, it breaks down to the same amino acids. It's just from a practical standpoint, 
you're just going to have to consume, you know, you're going to have to be very much more mindful about what you're consuming and yeah, increasing the, the volume of what you're consuming. I mean, another example, I, I did have someone that I worked with one-on-one who was, um, who was vegetarian. Thankfully, you know, he, he did eat eggs, which that helped that we're getting a little more protein density there. And he was eventually, he didn't really like dairy very much, but Greek yogurt can be a big, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, dairy and specifically like high protein, like Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, things Mm -hmm. like that can be helpful so that you're not consuming so much fibrous uh, sources of protein. Um, but yeah, I mean, his, he was around 190, 195 pounds and we were trying to get him to 170, 180 grams of protein. And his food logs were long as shit. Like it yeah. was like a lot of stuff. I, I commend him for how detailed his food logs were. So like your, your food log is like 74 items long per day because of just how much you're trying to mix and match and put stuff together. So he, he got good results from it, but that was because he was willing to, mm-hmm. to go, to go to those lengths. Yeah. Um, because he just, that was his preference. Yeah, I don't think it's any different for a person that's eating, you know, like an omnivore mm-hmm. diet or a carnivore diet. You just have to be very aware of what you're doing. And so if you're switching over to plant-based, specific to fitness, all, all the things matter, right? What is your goal, right? What are your specific needs? Um, and then obviously the quality and the quantity of the food that you put in trumps everything. Uh, you know, in the end, from a nutrition, nutrition perspective, particularly as you're trying to gain muscle, maintain a, a certain level of body fat, uh, and, and so forth. So, um, it's, if you've not played in that world at all, and you're not aware, you, you got some more to do, got some learning to do. Um, and if, you know, if you're on the other side and you're going, yeah, I would just never go plant-based because, you know, it would be too hard. Well, I, I get that, but I find that it's not, it's, it's equally as hard for people on the other side that don't put the work in, that don't get learned, yeah. right? That don't, that don't listen, you know, to the, the basic things that are out there and are trying to major in the minors and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so things to think about. What are the potential risks and benefits of using wearable fitness technology and how accurate are they? Wearable devices. Hmm. Uh, I've told my story a million times uh, for a long time. I probably probably 15 years, I did not wear a wearable device specific to my fitness tracking or, you know, any type of biometrics at all. Why? Because I believe one of the pitfalls that I fell in, fell into, uh, you can call it dangers uh, if you want, uh, which is how the question was, was phrased or risks, is that I validated everything based on what my electronic devices were telling me. It was purely objective all the time. And everything was being tracked. Everything was being logged. And I was in my own head, in my own space. I didn't have a team of people helping me to look at that. Plus maybe look at, and I was never encouraged, not internally or externally to look at subjective data. Like how am I actually feeling? What does my performance actually feel like when I'm out there? What am I actually achieving? It was all based on math. And so again, like I didn't have any from buddy with outside perspective going, Hey dude, um, maybe have a look at this here. Like maybe it's a little much, or maybe you're not actually working as hard as you think you're working, which is a, which is a pitfall, which we can talk about. And in the end, what I found was, um, after ditching it, that my performance level actually went way up, uh, after ditching, ditching the stuff when it was like freedom. Like no more devices on the bike, no nothing on my my wrist when I was running or swimming, anything like that. Um, I had had enough. Part of maybe this was that I had had enough experience um, over my years manage or monitoring all this stuff to to have a better idea of how hard I was or wasn't working. Um, but we can talk about some of those things and 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 where I think the challenges or the risks risks are. But that's my story on devices. I've recently put back one back on. I'm basically just tracking a ton of data. I'm not looking at it. It's all being tracked on a regular basis. I'm not deciding anything yet. It's been months. I'm literally letting it run for months before I before I go back and look at it. That's just my my approach this time. But uh, I recently took mine off probably four four to six weeks ago. I've seen um, it sitting on the desk. <laughs> like it's all crusty and salty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Are you supposed to wash those things? <laughs> Wait, that happens in the shower. Um, you know, so I, I came to the, the game late as far as wearable devices, I think anyway. I mean, I was well into my late 20s and early 30s. Um, and I was using it for a long, slow distance training. 
And, you know, I found myself in a similar situation to where um, I would live by that thing. And as far as like, what's my heart rate when I'm running? What's my heart rate when I'm, I'm riding? If I didn't get quote unquote high enough, then I wasn't working hard enough. But then I also recognized that if I kept it at like a, an even 136, that I was able to last longer through my, my workouts and I felt a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, then there was uh, a time where, um, I, I picked up a, a different device and I started wearing it because I wanted to see what my HRV was. So, you know, the number of milliseconds that it takes between your your heartbeat and to see what my recovery was. And I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting feature. Let me try this out. But then it also had the capability to, um, I, I'm used, doing air quotes, uh, detect my um, oxygen saturation. And I think I got really interested in that because I have seasonal asthma. And uh, when COVID came around in 2019, 2020, um, I started thinking, am I having a hard time breathing because of seasonal asthma or am I having a hard time because I haven't been on my bike or do I have COVID? You got the vid. (laughs) You know, and there was a period of time where I actually did have COVID. So Mm. I was looking at that just to kind of check in and see what my oxygen saturation was. still doing 40 (laughs) miles a day on the bike. (laughs) Oh my God. Well, that's a different story. But anyway, um, you know, I took it off recently because I was like, you know what? I'm done with this. I just want to be more in the moment as far as Mm. when I wake up, I don't want to look at my watch first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's my HRV? You know, am I recovered? Am I in the red? How do I feel Uh, today? Yeah. (laughs) Right. So basically go off of how do I feel versus looking at, looking toward the device. And, uh, you know, I feel a lot more free these days, but I'm not, I'm not training for a long, slow distance thing where I'm having to gauge my heart rate on a regular basis. So to make sure that I'm not overtraining and that I'm not in the recovery debt, um, I don't know. I find it kind of liberating, but at the same time, I get it because, you know, I do get into data. I, I mm-hmm. do find it interesting, but mm-hmm. as of right now, no. Yeah. I think I was also a, a late adopter. Um, I'm wearing, uh, a, a whoop right now. Um, I have gotten kind of used to wearing it. This is the first wearable I've ever had ever. Um, even my, uh, like my running watch, my GPS watch is like a very basic model. It doesn't give me much data beyond just like my pace and time. And I've never, I don't get super into it. Um, and, uh, yeah. And when I started wearing the, the wearable, I was like, oh, this is kind of neat. I kind of like the data, but I actually find myself more so I still lean much more onto the subjective mm-hmm. side of things. And this was actually case in point on, uh, on Sunday, I had, uh, like a 10 mile run and I, I looked, uh, at, you know, the, I, I looked at the data after the workout and I was like, my fucking heart rate wasn't that high. No, it wasn't. I'm like, but I was still going off of my perceived rate of exertion mm-hmm. and telling myself that that's correct. And the device is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, which, I don't know, maybe the device is right. Maybe the device, maybe it's a combination of both, but I still find myself um, going primarily off of my subjective feedback and saying, oh, this stupid thing's wrong. It's, it's inaccurate because how I feel is still my primary, uh, my primary uh, resource. But I have noticed um, there are times when I'm like, yeah, do I, I do feel kind of run down right now. Mm-hmm. And the data does reflect that or um, when, uh, you know, they're, the first time that I knew the thing was doing something was I had, uh, I was feeling a little bit sick for a couple of days and the data really changed. Like I was like, I've never seen that number before. I've never seen those red bells and whistles before. Like I've never seen any of that. And I do feel like shit right now. <laughs> so maybe there's some, accuracy yeah, too. yeah. I was like, okay, so maybe it is somewhat accurate, but, um, but yeah, I think the, uh, you do tend to get a little addicted to the data. I have thought about that. I'm like, well, now I'm kind of in the habit of checking it on a daily basis. How would I feel if I went back to what I did for the first 17 years of training and not having any of that type Mm -hmm. of data? Um, Not even, like I was running competitively for a while without, like I wasn't paying attention to my heart rate hardly ever. Um, And now I do pay attention. I was like, okay, maybe I should systematize this a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, I still... I'm leaning primarily on my subjective feedback. So. You know, it's interesting. Some of the greatest athletes in the world don't use, mm-hmm. don't use this technology that much. Uh, you know, and their coaches don't either. And it, it's, 
I think there's a give and take it, it, at the end of the day. And, and you, you both have just mentioned it. Uh, part of this was like, how, are, how accurate are they and so forth? Well, before we even get there, I think one of the, one of the problems we're faced with as a society now is we have entirely too much information. And I don't mean that as a bad thing. I just mean it's accessible to us and we're constantly out there taking in all this information and in our brains uh, as humans, we are not designed to take in all this information and do good with it. Like it's just too much at, 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 at any given time. That is my firm belief. Like that we're just being overloaded with, with information versus picking something to focus on and getting all and gathering a bunch of information or gathering a ton of information on that particular thing to make some reasonable determinations, some rational, reasonable, logical determinations. So I think you know, when, when people are strapping devices on, they've got all this information that's in front of them and they really don't understand how to use it. This goes for coaches too. Like they, uh, and, and I was, was a while back, I think when, you know, when Apple was coming out with the iWatch, like this thing is going to revolutionize, you know, the fitness industry and everything else. And I, I pushed back and I said, no, I think this is actually going to be a bad thing. I think because now people are going to be just know just enough to get themselves into a lot of trouble. And now you give them a device that's going to validate what they don't know, mm -hmm. right? What they think they know, but they really don't know. They're going to be making these determinations, uh, programming adjustments, or even health considerations based on what these fucking devices are saying. Now, that is not to say that devices aren't valuable, right? And they can't provide you some value information. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying I think they can provide a lot of valuable information, but how much information do we really need? Uh, and at what point is it taking away rather than benefiting the exerciser or the coach or whatever else? And to my point, it was just like, Jesus, all I'm thinking about is what my heart rate monitor is telling me or what my recovery data is telling me, right? Like I, it, I didn't like, how was my workout today? Did I enjoy fucking being outside on my mountain bike on the trail in beautiful California you know, foothills or in the mountains here in the redwoods and all that shit. Mm -hmm. That shit's important. Like, mm -hmm. why was I exercising in the first fucking place, right? It was, it, for me, it's all of it now is about health and wellness and a certain level of readiness, you know, that I can hopefully handle things as they come along in life and be able to enjoy, take advantage of opportunity, but also be in a position to to handle a situation uh, that might require me to do so for myself or for my loved ones or my family, whatever that might be, uh, from a car accident to zombies, to, to zombie apocalypse, <laughs> right? And, and anything in between, you know, whatever I can do, maybe it's helping my, you know, my brother move his house. Like if he calls me up and says, Hey man, I'm moving. Can you come over and help me? My first admit, you know, answer would be fuck you. No, <laughs> but uh, that's my brother. Cause I love him. And, yeah. but I, of course I'm going over there and I don't want to be a liability over there and only be able to, get the couch halfway out the door before I'm a disaster. My point being is when you're exercising and when you're choosing a device and, and, you're, uh, and, and you've chosen to use a device, you should have a very, very firm and well-developed answer to why it is that you're wearing that device. Uh, because if you don't, then the information that it's giving you is relatively worthless. You need to be able to apply, apply it to a why. And there are a lot of things, obviously we've talked about heart rate, right? There's so much science behind heart rate zones at this point where I think there's a lot of valuable information and a lot of value can be put um, on those things with regard to how you organize your training, right? Uh, and if you're organizing your training, to just throw it on, right? And just start wearing it and go to a workout and say, oh, well, I hit my orange zone today and I hit my quote unquote fat burning I zone. I closed my rings. I did it, <laughs> right? That's not rooted in a lot of logic planning or I don't think a why, unless all you're looking for is an emotional, you know, hit, you know, just a, like if that provides dopamine hit for you, then that's fine. I think that's a little weak and a little shallow and very undeveloped. But at the same time, like for some people, maybe that's the thing. Um, part of it is, is a compare and contrast for people. Like they're, 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 they're able to share things socially. Look what I did today. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's danger in that. Like, again, why are you using this? Why are you, why is this information important? Because if it's so you can post it on your Facebook or, you know, in your workout group or whatever and say, look, I'm better than you. Um, I, I have questions about that. I'm not sure that's super healthy. I think quite frankly, there's risk in that over time. Cause I think you're losing touch with things. And if you, if you haven't discovered that yet, just wait longer, keep doing it. I think you will. In terms of, uh, but in terms of the value that they provide, I think there are some things, heart rate being one of those things. We start getting into like recovery. You mentioned like oxygen saturation. 
uh, recovery specifically with like HRV. I think the jury is still out on these things. Um, the, oh yeah, we've had that conversation with a couple people in our industry, yeah, you know, we, professionals. We have. Yeah. Yeah when, I, I, yeah. when I look at the o- oxygen, uh, whatever it is on the whoop, I'm like, uh-huh. how is it like what? Yeah. yeah how, how is it measuring that my, uh, my blood oxygen levels? How is this thing? It is it yeah. right at the end of the day. It isn't, I think, you know, it's taking some actuated values on some algorithms and it's trying to learn you and it's plugging that in with all the other data that's being combined from all the rest of us idiots that are wearing similar devices because all of that data is being sold, which mm-hmm. I believe there's a risk in this and that everything that goes into that is not private. So somebody has that data. That is another conversation for another time. Listen to the After Dark episode with Aaron Czar from, from the, the company Silent. Uh, we talk a lot about, about protecting your privacy and your personal information and how that, that may or may not be used uh, for uh, the benefit of you and others and or maybe some nefarious purposes. And when I think nefarious, um, I don't know that developing a product uh, to sell to somebody um, is necessarily de- nefarious. I think that could go l- a little bit either, either way. But when you start looking at things like HRV, um, there are some companies out there that are a little bit of hot water. You mentioned one of them already in the whoop and people are asking like, well, hold on a second. This HRV data, which is how they really, they put the in, mark out there. In my, my opinion, which is really what put them on the map. They did not share that information with anybody. They didn't actually say how they came up with that, inf- with, with the, with the data that they're, they've, They've, they're, the device is calculating and they've kind of kept that very, very private. So nobody really knows. So, but at the same time, going back to the term adoption, everybody just decided like, oh, well, they've done it. So through the marketing and whatever else. And again, I want to be really careful. Like I'm not endorsing Whoop and I'm not shitting on Whoop. I'm just saying I have a lot of questions and I think other people should have them too. Now, does that mean that there isn't any value in it? I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, if you're putting all of the value into that, and that is uh, how you're determining all of your decisions based on that device and that particular uh, um, data set, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, I think there's some risk in that. Like, I, I don't know that that's entirely in, in, in mm-hmm. entirely accurate. So, it, what types of health, fitness, wellness decisions are you are you making based on your devices? readout, um, as opposed to what other things are you looking at uh, that to help you determine more of an objective evaluation around where your health and fitness is? Because the device certainly isn't going to tell you all of that, right? I think there's things like blood work. I think there's things like, uh, there's other biometric things that you should be looking at. We've talked about body composition. Uh, look at uh, things like blood pressure. Look at things like, again, just go back to blood work. What's your hormone panel look like? What does your cardiometabolic panel look like? Um, these are all things that uh, I think you should be utilizing alongside uh, your device to make uh, determinations about your health, your fitness, your performance, and so forth. So I, I don't I, I think that's probably maybe as specific as we can get um, because I, I don't want to go back to this. I didn't say whoop is inaccurate. I just said, you have questions. I have questions about it. Uh, I the, kind of figure it's fairly inaccurate sometimes. Yeah, the, the, the oxygen saturation thing through a watch, off your wrist. I love technology. I think it's cool. It's part of the reason I stopped wearing it because I'm like, really? Like, I, I really don't know. I, there are There is technology out there, but it's not on a watch in order to, to detect this. Um, that said, I, I think there's, the, the, the risk there are more like if you're basing all of your decisions or valid, and that mean that all, including validating your workout, whether or not it was a good one, and whether or not uh, you're worthy or not, based on what the device is telling you, that's that's risky. I think there's a risk in that. But if you're using it in combination with several other things to measure both objective and subjective data and feedback, I think it'd be very valuable because and and if you're doing it over a long period of time, uh, so that's and you understand actually what that is. Not whether it's accurate or not, but like, why am I measuring my heart rate? Like, Mm -hmm. how does, how, how does this relate to what I'm doing or not doing and how can I improve it? Or is this giving me some like warning signs that may be working too hard? Do I know how to adjust? Do I know how to program my personal information into my device to make that information worth a shit? Because if you don't understand, like a lot of this stuff will just go based on 
um, basic actuated values. If your height is this and your weight is this and you're a female, then this is the numbers that you should be at mm -hmm. with no consideration for you as an individual. Um, if you've got a device that doesn't allow you or like an app or something that doesn't allow you to put in your very, very specific information at a lot of levels, I'm going to go out there on a limb and say it's probably less accurate than the device that maybe does. But I don't know that for sure. I'm just, like I said, I'll go out there on a limb. Yeah, and I think that you have to uh, keep it. I think there's also, you know, going back to the the privacy side of things. Yeah, the obviously the more data you provide the app or the device, I think the more accurate feedback you will get. But you have to keep in mind that, okay, well, now that, that data is out there. Mm -hmm. So that's also something that, I, I've weighed in the past when I'm like, okay, how much, how much privacy am I willing to give up in order to get this data? Like, is this data valuable enough to me that I am willing to make that exchange? So that's something that I've also kept in mind because that is something where I'm, you know, I'm not always like, eh, you know what, I don't, I don't want to provide that information or I don't really, I don't really see how that information is relevant to what I'm looking to get out of this. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, outside of just the physiological standpoint. This is also something to keep in mind. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm really glad you you came over the top of that because I think that's something that we should all be more mindful of as well as our exercise and our health uh, is our privacy, our personal security and our privacy of our pers very personal information and how that might impact our health uh, down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't think that it is in terms of decisions that are being made out there. Uh, Definitely it, is. It 100% is. Uh, the, the things that, you know, go on in doctor's offices, that go on at the pharmaceutical level, insurance. more importantly, how much you pay for insurance, what you actually get, what you don't get, and where you get siloed mm -hmm. uh, based on your health and how much you pay versus don't pay with the company that you have or don't have. Um, it's all all weighed against data that is farmed from these types of things. So again, like that is a definite risk, I think on a, on a much larger level that I don't think a lot of people give a, you know, give a lot of thought to. And I'm really glad you brought that up. How do different types of intermittent fasting diets impact fitness and weight management? All right. The intermittent fasting question. We just handled a, an entire podcast on this. It was episode 123. Uh, you can listen to a lot of things about intermittent, intermittent fasting that are specific to uh, benefits, uh, pro uh, let's just say uh, proposed benefits, some things that are a little bit gray, uh, a lot of the misunderstandings, misconceptions, and we specifically handle this around the topic of weight loss. So if, you're, if your goal is weight loss. And so this question is asking, uh, again, different types of intermittent fasting diets impact fitness and weight management. I encourage people to go back and listen to the entire episode, but I think we can kind of wrap this up fairly, fairly quickly. Stephen, you and I kind of went back and forth about the difference between what is what the the terms intermittent fasting, uh, time restricted eating, and what maybe the definition of a fast actually even is. So, let's maybe recap in brief kind of what those things are, and then we can tie it directly into how it might affect your 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 fitness or your fitness plan. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think we spoke about, you know, intermittent fasting versus caloric restriction mm -hmm. um, and time restricted feeding being another, uh, another term for intermittent fasting. And the conversation is, well, are you truly, are you actually fasting or are you just restricting eating to a, a certain period of time? So I guess to, to break it down, intermittent fasting tends to refer to the frequency and the timing of when you're eating and manipulating that versus caloric restriction being just restricting your daily average intake of calories. So I hope that difference is fairly clear in terms of one is you're manipulating time and frequency and one is you're just on average lowering your daily intake of calories. Yeah. I think there's one other level to, lever to pull and, and that is like food restriction. And that is like something I'm eating or not eating within those other two things you just mentioned. Like yeah. I don't eat meat mm -hmm. or I don't eat animal products or um, I eat only animal products. I don't eat any plant-based products. So that, that kind of thing that would be, uh, or I don't eat dairy that, so that there's food restriction within there as well. So those are the three things that kind of anybody's trying to balance at any given time when it, as it relates to weight loss or weight management. Um, 
the end of the day, one of the questions that I have is, is like, we talked about like probably the most common thing around time-restricted feeding, or again, as it's also slash intermittent related to is intermittent fasting is the 16-8 uh, uh, basically eating plan where you would basically eat all of your food between 12 and 8 p.m. And then not eating anything from eight to twelve, eight p.m. to twelve p.m. the next day. So you, you'd be on a sixteen-hour quote unquote fast um, with eight hours of of time to get in the calories, the macronutrients, and the foods that that you're 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 proposing or that, that's proposed on your plan or that you need to get in for the day. That's probably the easiest way to kind of look at. It. I think most people are most people are, are, are aware of it, and a lot of people may do this unknowingly. Um, one of the questions I have though is, is like, is 16 hours really even a fast for a human being? Um, or is this just, uh, it's, it, it really is, is just, again, I'm, I'm time restricted in terms of how I'm taking in my calories to add the fast piece into that, in, uh, into that term I have questions about, and here's, here's where this relates back to like a lot of the studies that made this very, this topic very popular were done on mice and Mice within 48 hours will starve to death. They have to be eating constantly. They, they're different than humans, believe it or not. What? Yep. <laughs> believe it or not, their their physiology much different than humans. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. Uh, however, lots of studies on those, and we would like to relate those to human studies, right? Well, humans can go days, weeks, weeks without eating, up to like 30 days before you will starve to death. So is 16 hours really a fast for a human as it relates to the 16 hour study that was 16, eight hour studies that were done on mice? I have questions about this. That's why I have a tough time with that science. I think there's other things you start to get into longer periods, that being somewhere around the 48 to 72 hour period, which now without eating, right? So that, that to me for a human uh, is probably more of a fasting period. So as it relates to being an athlete, right, or fitness and, and how you might use these things or what the risks or benefits might be from, from time-restricted feeding, um, I think you have to understand, we have to understand what we're really talking about there. Um, if you're going days without eating, how does that impact you as, in your fitness as an athlete versus going a few hours, which is really what 16 hours is when you look at the bigger scheme of things as we compare mice to humans in my mind. Uh, so from a fitness perspective, I'm, I've chosen, I'm only eating between 12 and 8 PM. How could that impact my fitness? Well, here's what we know. Like if you're in weight management, here's what we know. It really is about if you, if you equate calories, right. And macronutrients across the board, whether you did it in 12 hours or eight hours, right. The results Roughly the same. Roughly thing. the same. Um, in fact, very when we say with negligible difference, right? Almost no no difference. It's so the timing of it doesn't make a lot of difference when it comes to weight management or even weight loss. Uh, what type of weight you're losing, um, how you are, and the rate at which you lose that weight, that has a lot to do with a lot of other factors. But we're going to keep this very high level, right? Now, if I was uh, if I was involved in a fitness program where, you know, I was working out intensely, let's say five days, five intense weight training days a week, Monday through Friday. Uh, and, uh, and I was eating 16, eight versus over a more, more, uh, prolonged or protracted period, like 12 hours. How might my fitness be impacted? Well, let's talk about that because in, in some cases, timing does matter from managing an energy. Yeah. From managing an energy systems perspective, as it relates to performance. So like if I'm, if I'm working out at 6 a.m. and uh, I, the last meal or, you know, 6 a.m. and I haven't eaten since 8 p.m. the night before and I don't plan on eating again until noon, uh, anybody that's gone through that, that period of time without eating will probably notice some energy depletion and maybe not get the best performance during their workout, right? Maybe they will, but they're probably not getting on the first day, but they're probably not going to get it on the second day because they're going to be chasing calories after the workout and they're in a depleted state and they're staying there for, let's say, four hours of time while your body is 
trying to anabolically respond. I'm not seeing the anabolic window. <laughs> it's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> but trying to anabolically respond to the stimulus that you gave you, you gave it. And with with lack of amino acids, uh, uh, potentially lacking glucose, uh, and those being the major things that the body needs in order to recover uh, for that period of time, you could be putting yourself in a depleted state and never really get out of the recovery debt, potentially by only eating in, in that time period. I'm not saying that's going to happen for everybody, but I'm saying over a prolonged period of time, the more intensity you put into your workouts, the harder your, the more gains you're looking for and the harder you're working, you could be restricting yourself there. Yeah. I think it's dependent on the type of workout that you're doing. It's dependent on when you're doing that workout, what exactly, you know, what performance metrics are you are you looking for? So yeah, I mean, that is going to be different for someone who is weight training versus someone who is endurance training. I mean, I know, you know, from, from an endurance standpoint, if I'm going to be, you know, I, I personally prefer to train fasted or close to fasted kind of like minimal food. Um, but if I'm, but that means that if I'm going to go train for an hour or two hours, I'm trying to eat like as soon as possible afterwards okay. mm -hmm. because I'm going to be very hungry and I need to, I need to, that's what I need to catch up or that's when I need to get something in. Otherwise, yeah, my energy levels are going to crash. Um, so there are some people that, you know, if they're going into an intense weight training session or something like that, and they don't onboard any carbs or anything like that beforehand, they notice a difference in their, in their power output, in their, you know, explosiveness, whatever the case may be. So there is some personal preference and, diversity based on style of workout and your, your goals. Yeah. So going, going back, like the other thing is if you have a caloric need and you're, you're, you're struggling, you may struggle to get it in an eight hour period. I mean, just purely the volume of food that you need to consume in order to maintain your, your total daily energy need, uh, in order to support not only your, your, uh, your exercise, but all the other activities of daily living, including just supporting your daily, your, your, uh, your, your functions as a human throughout the day, uh, you may struggle to get that in, in that amount of time. So in which case, at uh, quote unquote, intermittent fasting may not be the best thing for you. I think, again, that's very individual, um, going back to like what type of training. So I mentioned like heavy, like intense weight training, like your demands there from an energy systems perspective are going to be different maybe than they are for the endurance athlete, right. Who may be able to, uh, do a little bit better uh, when when they're slightly depleted, if you will, at the beginning. But again, going back, like if you don't start getting those calories back in you, uh, you, you start know, going downhill. You start going downhill. Like <laughs> cognitive function could decline, right? Your energy levels could decline, which you know could be uh, six and one half dozen in the other, depending on you know how you're feeling. And again, now you're chasing those calories throughout the day to try to to replete so that you can perform the next workout. So. It could be challenging. I'm not saying this is going to be the case for everybody, but that that could be one of the things. I think if we start to look at going into a longer fasted period, there are some things that people, you know, that there are some things that certain athletes I think can gain from this. Um, again, I mentioned we mentioned this on the other on the other podcast. Uh, there's a guy out there by the name of Peter Atia. Uh, he nerds the sh he nerds on this shit all the time. And it's fascinating to kind of to, to, to the depths that he'll go. But if you're a, uh, let's just say if you're a power athlete, right. Or somebody that's looking, you know, that does mainly max hypertrophy or strength training programming, going three days into a fast and expecting to be able to perform, uh, and get the gains, uh, is the gains that you're looking for. It's probably not rooted in a lot of logic, just merely from a from an energy systems perspective and, and a recovery perspective. Uh, on an endurance side of things, it could be a little bit different if we are trying to become, this term gets used a lot, uh, fat adapted. Mm -hmm. That is your body using, you know, being more adept to performing in, a, in an oxidative state. Uh, there may, may be some benefits there. And, and I would encourage you to maybe go 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 listen to, to Atia and, and some of the things he does. He's got a great podcast called The Drive. You can find them all over on YouTube. But he talks about this stuff. But I think, uh, you know, coming back to the weight management piece, this really does come down to uh, the quality and the quantity of the macro and micronutrients that you put in your, in your, in your body as it relates. And that obviously is your total caloric intake alongside what you're doing to manage all the other things 
sleep and stress management, uh, how much exercise you're doing, because that will dictate obviously how much you need to eat, you know, what those macros might look like and, uh, and how to maximize your, your fitness around your eating, you know, your eating timing. But I would also say this, and we say this a lot, um, and that is if the timing around your eating um, is such a minute detail for the majority of people uh, in terms of improving their performance and or weight loss. Uh, it is very, it's a very small percentage of the greater whole in terms of how we organize your, or how you should be organizing yourself in order to achieve your goals. Uh, there, there are times where this is important and depends on like duration of workout, you know, frequency of workouts, intensity of workouts. Th- those, those matter. We just mentioned that like, if you're going 16 hours with high frequency, high intensity and long duration, uh, that might be tough mm-hmm. for you to do in a, in, in a simple, in an, in an hour period. Uh, but that's not the majority of people. Uh, I think that intuitively the body knows when it needs stuff and it's telling you when it's hungry and it tell, it's telling you when it's, when it needs to eat. And you intuitively as an athlete, if you're starting to progress, you'll know like, man, I feel like shit today. And man, I haven't eaten in four hours. And I mean, you'll already know it before you start it. And if you didn't, once you get into it, you'll recognize, wow, my, I'm not as strong. I feel like shit. I'm tired. My recovery is taking Focus, longer. Yeah. And then you decide like, is intermittent fasting maybe the, the right thing for me? Yeah. When it comes to, I mean, bringing it back to weight management, the way I usually try to break it down for people is it's a, it's a helpful framework for those who are looking to restrict calories. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it helps them kind of stay on schedule. Um, You know, again, if your caloric goal is 2,200 calories and you can do that between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., awesome. If it is challenging for you uh, to stay within your caloric goal in that length of time and it is a helpful cue for you that I only eat between 12 and 8 and that helps you lop off the 400 calories that will put you into a deficit, great. It's a helpful framework. So that's When people have success with intermittent fasting and they don't really, they think it's some, it's the autophagy, it's the Mm -hmm. whatever, um, you know, the fasting period, you are just eating less and it's a helpful framework, like I said, to keep you on schedule. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of questions about this. It's come up again. It's somehow it's a little bit more novel. Uh, Again, like these things are cyclical. It's come back. Uh, If you have specific questions about this, with regard to your specific nutrition and fitness plan, health and wellness, longevity, performance, uh, whatever it happens to be that you're trying to achieve, uh, I encourage you to reach out to us here at Red Dot Fitness. You can check out the website. It's uh, rdftrainonline.com. When you get there, you're going to find out ways or you'll see ways where you can have direct conversations with Steven or anybody here on the staff to help you with your program, specifically your nutrition. Talk about all kinds of stuff. If you just want to have a brief chat to find out if there's maybe this could be a good fit to help you down the road. Again, that's rdftrainonline.com. You can pick up the phone and call us or you can email us directly using the contact page there. So um, I I encourage anybody to do that. We're here. We're here, you know, six days a week um, and uh, would love to hear from you.